All right, folks, let's get started on 17.3 and 17.4. 17.3 is mainly just the anatomy. I'm going to whip through it pretty quick. I'll stop here and there to talk about some things we didn't hit in lab. And then 17.4 is the physiology. I'll spend most of my time on that. All right, a little bit of time here. Let me remind you that this, uh, this piece of connective tissue, this little loop or stirrup of connective tissue is called the trochlea. And the tendon of the superior oblique muscle runs through that trochlea. Here's the superior oblique muscle. And uh, the cranial nerve that innervates the superior oblique muscle is cranial nerve number four, which is called the trochlea. And the connective tissue is called the trochlea. And that's kind of cool. Uh, let, me re let me show you the lacrimal gland right here. It's the superior lateral side of the eye. These lacrimal ducts right here uh, carry the tears to, my, to the, my eye. The tears run across my eye. They're collected by these lacrimal canaliculi. You can see my lacrimal canaliculi here, right here and right here. So the tears are collected by my lacrimal canaliculi. They enter my nasal lacrimal sac, my nasal lacrimal duct, and eventually my nose. And this is why your nose runs when you cry, because your tears eventually run down in your nose. When the tears overwhelm the ability to be collected in here and drain into your nose, that's when they, that's when they spill out onto your cheek and run down your face and things like that. So that's the... Uh, that's the lacrimal gland. And one last thing. Let's go up here and talk about this. There's four cranial nerves that have parasympathetic activity. Ocular motor, three. Facial, seven. Glossopharyngeal, nine. And vagus, ten. So which one of these parasympathetic nerves make you cry? Which one hits the uh, lacrimal glands and makes you cry? Well, if you recall, the ocular motor nerve here does the iris and ciliary body. If you recall, the vagus nerve does the heart and lungs and viscera. If you recall, the glossopharyngeal nerve does the salivary glands. So it must be facial. Facial nerve does salivary and lacrimal. So cranial nerve number seven hits this lacrimal gland and causes you to cry. All right. That's the anatomy there. This is really all anatomy. Of the, it's showing you the tunics or the layers. A layer that the... the word for layer is tunic so some books call it the fibrous tunic the vascular tunic the neural tunic uh, the inner layer is sometimes called the neural tunic all right and this is called the vascular tunic sometimes and of course uh, what we did in the lab was we said the fibrous layer fibrous tunic was the sclera and the continuous with the sclera the the transparent cornea we said that the vascular tunic was the choroid all right, that's what we said there. And then we said that the neural tunic was the retina. The retina was the neural tunic. All right, so those are the tunics of the eye, and we already covered all this stuff in lab. This is the aqueous humor here in the anterior cavity. Whoops, can't spell. This is the vitreous humor. The aqueous humor was watery. And the vitreous humor was gelatinous. And then recall that in the anterior cavity, I have an anterior compartment between the cornea and my pupil. And I have a posterior compartment between my pupil and my lens. So now you can see the compartments of the anterior cavity because you're looking at from the right angle, the correct angle. All right, uh, this is really more anatomy. This is a blind spot right there, by the way. We'll talk about that when we get to the retina, where the optic nerve leaves the back of the eye is a blind spot. It is the area of the eye that doesn't have rods and cones. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Oh, what else to tell you here? You do have conjunctiva that line the inside of your eyelid and line your eye and the conjunctiva okay it looks like the conjunctiva stops right there uh there is a 
a conjunctiva that goes across your cornea. It's only a couple cells thick. So in other words, the ocular conjunctiva does cover your cornea, but it becomes thinner. Back in here, it's probably 10 cells thick, 10 layers thick, maybe, something like that. But the conjunctiva that covers your cornea is only a couple layers thick. So it, it does continue even though it looks like it stops. So that's conjunctiva, and of course you know conjunctivitis is inflammation of this layer. And that's about it. The rest is really anatomy. This is still anatomy. I do want to talk about this word right here, fovea. There is an area in the back of your retina which has the highest concentration of cones. Highest cone concentration. Brackets mean concentration. Highest cone concentration. It's called the, well, uh, it actually looks like a yellow spot. So we call it the macula lutea. Macula means spot and lutea means yellow. Within this macula lutea is the fovea centralis. And the fovea centralis, or just fovea, is the area of highest concentration of cones. It is the area of greatest visual acuity because your cones have great visual acuity. Your cones do. So this fovea centralis, or just fovea, is the area of highest visual acuity or the highest concentration of cones. And the rest of this is really anatomy. Oh, I'm looking for something that I, is there anything I didn't talk about? No, it looks good. Looks like we talked about all this stuff. All right. All right, your iris, you probably don't know this. Your iris is made of two muscles. You have your pupillary dilator muscles right here. They are radial muscles. They are running radially like this, like radial spokes. These are your pupillary dilators. They're also called radial muscles. When they contract, your pupil dilates. So your pupil looks like this when they contract. Your pupil's big and it dilates. And you also have these pupillary sphincter muscles, also called the constrictor muscles. These are circular muscles. All sphincter muscles are circular muscles. When these guys contract, your pupil constricts. The ocular motor nerve, cranial nerve number three, is the one that innervates the iris. Oh, by the way, just so you know, the sympathetic nervous system also hits the iris. The sympathetic nervous system hits the pupillary dilator muscles sympathetically. And think about that. When you're running from the saber-toothed tiger, you want a large pupil so you can see the saber-toothed tiger coming from a long distance away. You want a lot of light entering your eye. The um, parasympathetic nervous system hits your pupillary sphincter muscle. And when you're resting and digesting, your pupil constricts. Drugs also have an effect on these. And you can, as you can imagine, the sympathetic nervous system, postganglionic fiber, secretes norepinephrine or epinephrine, and it binds alpha or beta receptors. So drugs that bind alpha or beta receptors can affect my pupillary dilator muscles. The parasympathetic postganglionic fibers secrete acetylcholine, and they bind muscarinic receptors. So as you can imagine, drugs that uh, bind muscarinic receptors can affect my pupillary sphincter muscles. So you can see that there. All right, so that's the pupil, two layers of muscles. By the way, the color of your eye is not simple Mendelian genetics. Everyone says, oh, brown is dominant over blue. But the color of your eye is not that simple. It does have to do with whether you make pigment or not. If you make a brown melanin pigment or if you don't make that brown melanin pigment and your eye is a gray or a blue. But it also has to do with how thick is this muscle, uh, what's the vas how vascular is the muscle, how many blood vessels are in it. Uh, it, has a, it has a lot more, how much myoglobin's in it. It has a lot more to do, there's more to it than just making the pigment or not making the pigment. And, and by the way, that's why we get different colored eyes like green or gray or blue or uh, hazel. I mean, all these different color of eyes. And it's, it's not as simple as just making the pigment or not making the pigment. 
this is the anatomy of your retina and I didn't do the anatomy of your retina in lab so now I'm gonna do the anatomy of your retina now notice this the light is coming from this direction this always messed me up uh, when I was an undergrad so I'm telling you that the light has to travel through the ganglion layer through the bipolar layer and then hit these photoreceptors which are rods or cones these are cones the purple ones I hope let me see yes the um, purple ones here are cone yep right there I just seen what they're naming them it's you know kind of arbitrary what color they put them these purple ones are cones and these brown ones are rods the rods and cones are your photoreceptor cells cones see color and have great visual acuity rods see in the dark see in the dim light okay dim light see at night and have poor visual acuity and they definitely don't see color but they're very sensitive to low levels of light so the rods help you see at night and the cones are what you typically use during the day because the rods are bleached out during the day all right so that's rods and cones the light has to travel through the ganglion layer through the bipolar layer and hit your photoreceptors then these photoreceptors send signals to the bipolar layer which sends signals to the ganglion layer which then sends signals to your brain in addition we have some anaxonic neurons we have two types of anaxonic neurons this is your first time seeing these we have amacrine cells and we have horizontal cells these are anaxonic neurons that moderate and either facilitate or inhibit the synapses between the photoreceptors and the bipolars or the bipolars and the ganglion and you can see that right here they don't have an axon because they're really not sending a signal anywhere all they're really doing is facilitating or inhibiting between the photoreceptors and the bipolars and between the bipolars and the ganglions in general what these horizontal and amacrine cells do in general what they do is they allow us to see contrast they help us see depth and they do that by moderating the signal between these layers that's what they do they they enhance or facilitate or they inhibit and they allow us to see contrast or depth better all right so that's the anatomy of the retina by the way we have a pigmented layer in the back of our eye all right this pigmented layer in the back of our eye absorbs extraneous light so the light rays aren't reflecting and bouncing all over the place and causing erroneous signals to be sent because that would ruin our visual acuity the ex, um, the extraneous light not absorbed by the photoreceptor cells is absorbed by this pigmented layer some animals have a tapetum lucidum whoops can't spell whoa 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 tapetum lucidum and it's not a pigmented layer but it's a reflective layer that does allow the light to bounce around back there and you're gonna say well that ruins your visual acuity it certainly does however the function of their tapetum lucidum is to see in the dark they don't really care about visual acuity they just care about seeing well in the dark to see if there's a big predator moving towards them they might not be able to make out all the details of the big predator moving towards them but they can see that big predator moving towards them whereas humans don't have that night vision uh, I mean we, we say we have night vision where our rods become s sensitive to low levels of light and, and, and that and that's true but we certainly can't see in the dark like a cat or a cow or a, or a deer or a dog we, we ha don't have no ability to do that so these animals have a tapetum lucidum and in fact the tapetum lucidum is what makes their eyes glow when when you hit them with a spotlight or headlights of your car H you know human lights human eyes don't do that we don't our eyes don't reflect back a, a green or a blue or a, a purplish color uh, but these an these other animals do when your headlights hit them or a spotlight hits them now when you say to me yeah but I have wedding pictures where my eyes are red well 
that's because the uh, flash of the camera picked up your blood vessels in the back of your eye. You're actually seeing these blood vessels here. That's the red in the pupil of your eye. Most professional photographers r remove that red eye before they print and, or sell you the pictures or whatever. So that's what's going on with the retina of the eye. Here's a histological uh, view of the retina of the eye. So you can see that this is my photoreceptor layer right here. That's my photoreceptors. Here's my bipolar layer right here. And then here's my ganglion. Whoop, I went a little too far, it looks like, with my bracket. Because my ganglion layer. Let me do that. Oh, you got brackets over here. Why am I drawing brackets? You have brackets. Here's your bipolar layer. And here's your ganglion layer right there. All right, so you have your photoreceptor layer, rods and cones, rods and cones. You have your bipolar layer here, and then you have your ganglion cells here. All right. That's the collage showing you lined up. There you go. That's the artistic drawing of the retina of your eye and the histological picture of the retina of your eye. Now, your, your blind spot in your eye. Your blind spot is where your ganglion cells all fuse into a nerve, and it's called the optic nerve. This area where that leaves the retina is called the optic disc. You have no rods and cones right here. It's a blind spot. If the image that you're looking at hits this optic disc, you can't see it. Because that image is not causing these ganglion cells to fire. Ganglion cells don't fire when light hits them. These photoreceptor cells react. I'm being careful what I say here, and there's a reason. Um, the reason is photoreceptor cells are going to do the opposite of what you think when we talk about the nervous, the neuronal transmission. So I'm trying to be careful how I say this. The photoreceptor cells react to light hitting them. And then the bipolar cells fire and the ganglion cells fire. But the ganglion cells don't fire directly when light hits them. The light has to hit the photoreceptor cells. So this optic disc is a blind spot in the back of your eye. And we can typically, typically test for a blind spot like this. We take a card like this, and you can, you can cover up one eye. All right, so you're, you find your blind spot, blind spot with one eye. And you might be able to do it, actually, from your computer if you back away and, and do this. And folk, oh, I just did it kind of accidentally, easily. I close my left eye, and I'm looking with my right eye only, and I'm focusing on the cross, and I can't see the circle. And I just move forward, and I can see the circle. And I move back, and the circle disappeared. Move further back, and the circle reappears. By the way, it doesn't matter. You could actually focus on the circle. And if you move back, the cross should disappear. Oh, it doesn't work as well with the cross. So do this. Focus on the cross, and that circle will disappear eventually. I, I think I know why, because the cross is a shape that the edges would actually hit your rods and cones. So I'm focusing on the cross, and at a certain distance, the circle disappears. I actually cannot see it, but focus on the cross. You can do this with both eyes. I'm doing it with my left eye now. All right, I'm unable to do it with my left eye at this point in time. Let me try it like this. Focus on the cross. There it goes. Circle disappeared. But then you can come closer and it reappears. So you can do that, but you have to focus on the cross and wait for the, the circle to, to disappear or reappear. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, well, I've done that before, but it always amazes me. All right. Now... Nothing. Oh, yeah, there is something new here. Actually, this was in lab, I believe. The, this um, aqueous humor right here, remember the aqueous humor is in the anterior cavity and the vitreous humor is in the posterior cavity. You, um, The vitreous humor you have is uh, is made and then uh, is made and then kept. The aqueous humor you make and reabsorb all the time. You make and reabsorb and make more, make and reabsorb. So the aqueous humor, uh, I, can't, I can't think of the word, um, flows or circulates, circulates, flows not the right word, circulates. The aqueous humor circulates. Well, how could that be? Well, how that is, is right here in the scleral venous sinus 
right here is the scleral venous sinus right here the aqueous humor reabsorbs through that scleral venous sinus well what makes the aqueous humor what makes the aqueous humor is the ciliary body the ciliary body makes the aqueous humor it comes up front of the lens through the pupil fills the anterior compartment of my anterior cavity by the way after the ciliary body makes it it fills the posterior compartment of my anterior cavity so the aqueous humor fills both compartments of the anterior cavity and then it's reabsorbed in my scleral venous sinus and my ciliary body makes more so my ciliary body is always making this aqueous humor and my scleral venous sinus is always reabsorbing it so i'm continuously making this aqueous humor uh, the vitreous humor is is it's very gelatinous and if you cut through the cow's eye you saw that this was very gelatinous you just make that and it, you keep that um, it doesn't circulate you don't you're not con constantly making more and then reabsorbing it so that's the aqueous humor all right let's talk about lent images on the retina okay so first of all your lens bends the light all right that's what your lens does if it's a fat lens it bends the light more and if it's a uh, if it's a I hope I said that correct if it's a fat lens bulging it bends the light more and if it's a flat lens very thin lens it doesn't bend the light much all right when something is a long distance away you don't have to bend the light to focus it on your retina and your your lens can become flat or thin but when something gets closer and closer and closer to you you must accommodate and what that accommodation is is you fatten your lens or allow it to bulge and then you focus the image on the back of your retina in addition because the light rays come through here and they hit the opposite side of the retina you actually the image on the back of your retina is flipped right to left and top to bottom so it's upside down and flipped right to left and we can see that with the telephone pole you can see that it's upside down but it's probably not as easy to see that it's right to left but with a with a picket fence with a with a pink picket and a blue picket you can see that it's flipped right to left so an image actually hits your retina flipped upside down and right to left and then your brain just puts it back in, into the normal of uh, orientation so that's an image on your retina all right so lens and focal distances we already said this what has to happen is this image has to hit your retina that has to be on your retina if the focal point of your image falls short of your retina you're not going to see it if the focal distance of your image um, is behind your retina you're, you're going to say to me how can it really be behind my retina that pigmented epithelium would absorb all that light exactly it would your pigmented epithelium would actually absorb all these light rays so the image doesn't actually hit behind your retina but it would hit behind your retina and now that image is not a a discreet sharp looking uh, image on your retina it's kind of diffused and and you have poor vision you're not seeing that image uh, well so the focal point of your image could fall in front of your retina or it could fall behind your retina and this leads to uh, vision problems so what we want is the focal point of our image to fall right on our retina well how do we do that our lens can change shape we can flatten or fatten our lens to uh, make the focal point of our image fall on our retina when a light comes from a distant source my lens has a short uh, has a short focal distance and i don't have to fatten up my lens much but as the image gets closer and closer and closer my focal distance is further so in order to keep it from falling behind my retina i fatten my lens and i make my image fall on my retina so that's what my lens does it just flattens or fattens depending on where the image is okay so again you must know this for close vision i have a fat round lens for far vision i have a flat thin lens all right the ciliary muscles right here are the muscles that either uh, flatten or fatten my lens all right now let me tell you something here's my ciliary muscles 
all right here's my lens lens here's my ciliary muscles here's the suspensory ligaments suspensory ligaments now if my lens contract I'm sorry if my ciliary muscles contract because they're circular then my ligaments gain a lot of slack and if my ligaments gain a lot of slack my lens fattens up so ciliary contraction yields to fat lens this is probably the opposite of what you thought you probably thought the ciliary muscle contracted pulled on a ligament and flattened out your lens pulled on your lens but the opposite occurs the ciliary muscle is a circular muscle by the way you're gonna say does it look circular here it's all around the lens it's completely um, it's circumvents the lens so it goes behind the screen and in front of the screen it's all around the lens it's a circular muscle so when the ciliary muscle contracts and and becomes tighter like this dotted line these suspensory ligaments gain a lot of slack there's a lot of suspensory ligament here now well that doesn't pull on the lens at all so the lens gets fatter when my ciliary muscle relaxes and it goes to this thick line out here then my suspensory ligaments are tight and they pull on my lens and flatten it out so my suspensory ligaments are tight right here so ciliary relaxation yields a flat lens so for distant vision your ciliary relaxes for close vision my ciliary contracts my sympathetic nervous system make sure I can see a long ways away and I get good distant vision so it relaxes my ciliary muscle my parasympathetic ocular motor nerve can, uh, hits my ciliary muscle and it makes sure that it contracts and I have good close vision and there you go all right what happens when the lens doesn't work correctly well what happens is if the image falls short of my rep my my retina I have myopia or nearsightedness it means I can see things near nearby but I can't see things far away so if this is my red dot and here's my red dot falling short of my retina if I move this red dot closer now the red dot would fall on my retina okay so I can see things near nearby I can see things close up this is called myopia by the way the word myopic is used in another way to say you have a very very myopic view of the world or very myopic view of the company they're saying you don't have good uh, long-term plans very myopic that's another way of using the word myopic it just means you're not planning ahead but for physiology here myopia is nearsightedness you can see things near you know, close up but you can't see things far away and this is showing you the divergent um this is showing you the corrective lens a concave lens that corrects the uh, the myopia all right so that's myopia nearsightedness you can see things near you can't see things far away hyperopia is farsightedness you can see things far away but you can't see things um, close up if this is your red dot and it's falling behind the retina and I obviously you know it doesn't fall behind the retina the pigmented epithelium picks up the light rays but certainly what does hit the retina is not a focused image so it's very blurry to you what happens is if you move this red dot further away it would it would move from here to here and be focused on your retina this is called near I'm sorry this is called farsightedness or hyperopia 
and what you use is you use a convex lens. Oh, let me go back and tell you how I remember the difference here. Concave makes a cave. That's the cave. Concave lenses make a cave. They're indented. Convex lenses are the opposite. They bulge out. So with hyperopia, we use convex lenses. And with myopia, we use concave lenses to correct that that uh, vision problem. Now, there's a special type of hyperopia called presbyopia. It's going to hit us all. It's already hit me. I have reading glasses because of that. It's old person hyperopia, for lack of a better way to uh, say it. And by the way, presby means old man. You can see that right there. So it's old person hyperopia. And what it really is, is your lens doesn't have the ability to change shape as much. So you can see things far away, but as they get closer, you can't accommodate. And therefore, things look blurry to you. So what you have to do is get reading glasses so you can read things close up. But your, your distant vision is just fine. Now, what a camera does is a camera changes where the lens is. You know, the camera actually, uh, you know, moves the lens in and out. That's what a camera does. But what we do is we change the shape of the lens. So we're not like a camera in that way. Although we're like a camera in the way that we have a lens just like a camera has a lens. Emetropia means normal vision. I didn't point that out before. Whereas myopia is nearsightedness and hyperopia is farsightedness and presbyopia is farsightedness due to age. All right. Now, let's keep going. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to make just a 17-4, because um, I, I talked too much on the anatomy, more than I was going to. So uh, I'm going to do a 17-4 and make a separate mini-lecture.